Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast, a weekly podcast for information security defenders, where we bring you discussions on best practices, tools, and implementation for enterprise security. Now, here are your hosts for today's show, Andy Ja and Adam Brewer. Welcome to another episode of the Blue Security Podcast. I'm Andy, your host. I'm Adam, your co-host. We've got a great show lined up for you tonight. This is our last episode that we're recording in 2021, and we'll publish this episode first thing in 2022. What I wanted to talk about first is, again, apologies, but another Log4j update. But I found this to be a really interesting uh, article by the Google security team. So Google's open source insight team published a blog, which we'll link to, but it's their security blog, where they surveyed all the Java packages in the Maven Century Central repository, where they wanted to determine the whole scope of the issue in the open source ecosystem on Java-based languages and packages to see the ongoing efforts that were happening to help mitigate any of the affected packages. The Maven Central repository is the largest and most significant package repository for Java, Java applications. And it has about 440,000 Java packages total. What the Google team found was there were over 35,000 packages that were vulnerable to the versions of Log4j, both the core and the API, which was roughly 8% of all the Java packages within Maven Central. And just to give you an idea, when most critical security flaws are found, it typically only affects 2% of the packages within Maven Central. So 8% is extremely, extremely terrible and large in scope in the amount of packages that it's affecting. And what they also found was 80% of the Java packages affected by the vulnerability can't be updated directly because they're dependencies of different libraries that are being coded. So for example, if I'm a developer and I'm calling a library, And that library calls a different library, which calls a different library, which then invokes the log4j code. You're several dependencies deep. So I have to wait for the first developer to update their library that directly called the log4j code, recompile their code into a new library. Then the person after that who called that library has to then update their code with the new code and so on and so forth till it gets to me. And if there's anyone in that chain that is on vacation or is lazy or decides, hey, I don't want to do this anymore, then it basically stops. And my code can never get updated because the dependency library hasn't been updated. And so it will always be affected by the log4j vulnerability. So... Some of the good news is when you're looking at these vulnerabilities just in general, the team found that more than half of the artifacts that were affected by the vulnerabilities in the past were fixed, but half of them have not over many years. So if you're looking at Log4J, again, that's why they're thinking that this Vulnerability may affect many, many libraries for years to come. The positive thing is that just in a few weeks, there's been about 13% of all the libraries that have been fixed, which is a lot quicker than any other critical vulnerability. And we mentioned on our previous show that there are a lot more maintainers and people who are looking at the source code now and hoping to fix the problem as quickly as possible. So there is hope, but only time will tell whether or not we'll actually get over the hump on all of these dependencies. So in the end, the moral of the story is that this vulnerability is going to affect code for a very, very long time. It'll depend on coordination between different project teams to help resolve you know, different libraries that have dependencies on each other that go, you know, some go 12 deep on dependencies for different libraries. So definitely you want to, Keep hardening your networks, monitor any type of suspicious activity, 
and work with those developers to get a timeline. If you are one of those ones who are working with a library that is dependent on another library, on another library, and so on and so forth, that is invoking the Log4j code. So just wanted to give you an update on that. We'll post the link in our show notes, but I found that to be a really, really interesting read and forecast of what's to come. Great work here by the uh, Google Open Source Insights team to look at the Maven central repository and all of the packages in there because it is a very representative sample of the overall Java ecosystem. And, you know, the news here is not incredibly encouraging, but it does also look like Log4j has got the attention of many people that, that might not have considered updating their packages or their libraries in the past. So there is hope. Um, obviously for some of those libraries that have that indirect dependency on Log4j where it's like several layers deep, they of course do have the alternative of rewriting their code so it can use a different library as well. And some of them may, you know, coordinate to make that determination, right? Like I reached out to this library maintainer and they've indicated or, or clearly the project's dead. There've been no new commits to the GitHub repo in you know, five years. We're going to have to rebuild. So I think a lot of actively developed libraries will take a look at those downward dependencies. And I think Log4j is different in that they're just not going to sit on them. If they're unable to see progress happening in those indirect dependencies, they'll go another direction. Now, again, this is where open source is challenging because it's all volunteer, unpaid, you know, people doing this in their extra time. And they might say, okay, I am going to rewrite my portion of the code that calls this abandoned library, but I don't have time to do that right now. So my ETA on accomplishing that six months out. So certainly for information security teams, the takeaway here is a log4j free or log4 shell free future uh, is, is not in the cards. So mitigation strategies, boy, this sounds familiar, Andy, for uh, something else going on in the world is going to be really important because there isn't going to be a containment strategy here or elimination strategy. It's going to be more of a, uh, a mitigation strategy where we, we test and monitor and look for examples of potential compromise and attempt to keep those as limited as possible. So work with your web application firewalls, work with your uh, EDRs and, and everything else and, and SIMs to have your fingers on the pulse as best you can and try to uh, nip any potential compromise in the bud. But uh, it looks like log for shell is here to stay for at least some length of time. Another article that I read recently was that AV Comparatives released its December 2021 business security test report, and it awarded the quote-unquote approved business product accreditation to 19 antivirus solutions. What struck me as interesting of this article and reading through the report being that we're in security and I was curious to see what products were out there was that the benchmarks for each one of these solutions were all very, very close. So oftentimes when I talk to security teams, they are nitpicking like, Oh, this particular product has this capability and this capability or this feature and this feature. And really, you know, what it comes down to for me is what fits your budget what is implemented in your corporation or what is most easily implemented? And is it giving you the data and feedback that you require as part of your business objectives? And if it is, that's probably fine, right? As long as it's working. And if you look at these numbers, none of them are 100%. And you should know that going in. Like no AV solution, no security solution is 100% foolproof, which is why we stack solution on top of solutions. So that was really my takeaway was, you know, if you look at this report, there's 19 solutions on here. They all look pretty good. Microsoft is one of them. And, 
you know, Adam and I were both very upfront in that we work for Microsoft and, you know, we are security solution sellers. So we do sell, you know, the Microsoft security solutions. And it's part of this as well as 18 other solutions, which are all just as good, you know, as far as their protection. We're talking like 99.6% versus 99.7%, you know, one false positives, two false positives. It's, you know, we're nitpicking here. And so, all of them, I think, would be good for any organization to protect themselves. You want to look at how they integrate with your tools, which is important, right? As long as they're integrating with your tools and talking to each other, which for Microsoft, they all work within our suite. So if you're a big Microsoft shop, it's advantageous for you to use our security products because they all talk across the board. So, um But yeah, I I thought that this was interesting. Definitely take a look at the report because these are the ones I think are fairly common. If yours is not on here, maybe that's something you may want to look at. If it's some just one-off solution that's not on the approved business product, maybe look at one of the ones that are on here. But there's certainly, these are all the popular ones that I've seen before. I agree with your takeaway on this as far as it's table stakes at this point. And I think our listeners who are security professionals, we sometimes talk about how there's this desire to be, you know, kind of the cool hacker, you know, banging on the keyboard and, you know, yelling out loud that you're going after the bad guys. And and everyone wants that kind of sexy red team, red hat kind of experience. But as blue teamers, you know, we need to be very judicious with our time and our resources. And so what I've noticed from my perspective is security teams kind of, I don't know, everyone wants to be the hero, right? Everyone wants to be the one who, who nails the, the, the big company and shows them that their product is crap or whatever. And so I've seen where you have an incumbent product in place and you're evaluating another solution and you throw your like crack team of hotshot security guys at it to go find out um, when it won't detect something. Oh, ha ha. Big company. We found out that your product doesn't detect when I do it this way. And what this result kind of shows is that effort, not that you shouldn't do your due diligence, but to Andy's point, maybe less around the detection and capabilities there because they're so consistent across the board now because that is table stakes. It's those other questions you should be asking. Is this a solution you can easily implement? Is this a solution that works with your other security tools? What does that integration and implementation look like? Uh, Does this work in a vacuum or does this feed signal to other solutions? All of those are good questions to ask, but I, I think the days of doing like this super serious bake off where you throw your security guys at the new tool and they're, effort is to prove why it sucks is kind of a waste of time at this point, because clearly 19 different solutions. And if you go re- click the link in the show notes, there's going to be vendors you haven't even heard of in this space. Andy and I were, I read the list out loud in the pre-show and there were a couple of them. I'm, I'm like K seven, you know, who's, who's that? Okay. Kaspersky. Yep. Know that one McAfee. Sure. Uh, who, who's this, you know, it was a little back and forth there and it just shows that like, there are a lot of really good protective solutions in the antivirus space. So think bigger than that and think bigger than trying to nail them down on a gotcha because a a, a vendor like, you know, AV comparatives that's ISO certified uh, has found that they all deliver very comparable terms of protection. So I, I think we can change our methodology as we evaluate different solutions, which is healthy and good and something we should do but we should look at different things when we're doing our comparison instead, I think is the big takeaway here. So as 2021 comes to an end, I think, you know, just a little look back on some of the major attacks and we've talked about them on this show and really what I think as defenders, we've learned from each one of them. So log for j You know, we've been talking about that one. Kind of saved the best one for last. This was one of the worst, if not the worst vulnerability of the last, you know, few years. And, uh, you know, I think we as defenders have learned that, you know, open source for, you know, as, as Adam and I have talked about, is not always the, you know, knight in shining armor. It's not always the 
the quiver and the arrow or the arrow and the quiver that uh that will save the day um it has vulnerabilities that people aren't looking at because they're volunteers and not everybody has the time so maybe if you are a developer you look at something that's paid code or at least a supported open source library that has paid people who are maintaining it that may be a safer bet especially if you're building enterprise software the colonial pipeline that was a huge one you know it elevated ransomware to a national security issue and our administrations have had discussions with you know other administrations in other countries about what is off limits and what they can and cannot attack and so you know that was a big one that pe- regular people felt that one because the the pipeline was shut down. Kaseya again kind of focused attention on that supply chain attack. You know, SolarWinds didn't make this list because it was at the end of 2020, but Kaseya kind of brought that back into focus. And if you remember, that was the ransomware attack where it was an IT an IT third party solution where they were s- servicing many different companies, and um, that kind of uh, impacted a ton of different companies because Kaseya was the one that was attacked. There was the exchange server proxy logon, you know, that kind of brought into the importance of maintaining patching as well as, you know, maybe getting off your legacy systems. If you're still running exchange on prem, maybe it's time to move to exchange online. We had Bradley Dupay on the show where we talked about Windows 365, but he extensively talked about Exchange Online and mitigating that risk and migrating to the cloud where you're not maintaining that infrastructure. You're also offloading that risk to Microsoft. We should be the ones running the Exchange servers, right? And so that I think that was a, an important lesson there. And if people are still running Exchange servers, maybe it's time to look at a more modern solution. And then finally, I, this one was also interesting. We talked about it when it happened, but the Florida water utility hack, and that was also someone clicking on something, or actually I think it was a remote uh, software like TeamViewer that was left up and running. And you know, our critical infrastructure is always vulnerable to cyber attacks. And I think if you're in that industry, you got to really pay attention to what you're putting on to the machines and hardening all around it because if you're leaving something like team viewer or something like that with a shared password on a critical system that should be isolated, you know, and that really can apply to any system in any corporation, right? Having remote access outside of the network, that's not a good idea. So those were some of the, the ones that I thought were interesting. Uh, any thoughts on that, Adam? Yeah, I think Colonial Pipeline, as well as the Florida Water Utility hack combined, really did elevate the mind share of cyber attacks in the broader public eye, and certainly got the attention of the Biden administration and the government in general on ways they need to be an active participant in helping to shut down, defund, break the revenue generation of these different ransomware and attack groups. And that's actually what the government did in, in our episode a couple of weeks ago, we did an episode about how things are getting better. And one of the things we focused on was the way the department of justice, the FBI, the United States federal government has gotten involved with making this seen as kind of an act of war, you know, between uh, nations and and in the sense that it's it's something we take very very seriously and don't just farm out to private enterprise anymore. The the government is taking an active position in this and that attacks on private enterprise are attacks on the United States as a sovereign state and are, are being dealt with in a much more serious manner than perhaps in the past. So that is encouraging. Uh, but both of those kind of did that. And and again, the other thing about the Florida water utility hack, you you nailed it, Andy. It was something like Team Viewer. It's you're only as strong as your weakest link, you know. I mean, you can have all of these controls in place. You can have isolation of your IT and OT networks, and someone leaves something wide open on an OT network, and okay, here we go. 
if you recall, I believe the attackers actually had broken in and sent commands to like start pumping in way uh, lethal levels of certain chemicals into the water supply. And someone like caught that before it actually executed, but they were well on their way to doing that. And that's, that's, I mean, quite frankly, terrifying. So uh, I certainly got a lot of attention there. Uh, so I think as we looking back on some of these breaches and vulnerabilities and cybersecurity incidents, I think 2021 was a banner year where the incidents that happened really opened up a lot of people's eyes so that cybersecurity really, really isn't just an IT problem anymore. It's a business problem, right? Like CEOs and board members are involved in understanding that cybersecurity has an impact to their organization and their profits. I think that, you know, with the fuel of like um, nation state attacks and ransomwares, you know, that were happening in 2021, this was a banner year, right? Uh, There was a report that was released by JP Morgan International Council, which identified that the most significant threat facing businesses and governments is cybersecurity, right? Cyber attacks. And while I don't think we could ever win against malicious attacks, I think that it is definitely possible that we could lose. And towards the beginning of the year, I think it did feel like we were losing. But as Adam said, you know, we did have that episode where we felt like things were getting better and the Department of Justice and the FBI were involved in fighting back and starting to arrest and charge people uh, who were part of these attacks. So I think towards the end of the year, it didn't feel like we were losing as much, but definitely in the beginning, I definitely felt like, you know, we were, we had our backs to the wall essentially. So what is next for 2022? You know, I think there are a lot of leaders who are calling for a tighter cooperation between businesses and government And so you're starting to see that with some of the policies that the Biden administration is putting out. There was that uh, law or policy, I believe, that was um, through the financial systems for banks where they had to disclose different uh, ransomware or cyber attacks within uh, a certain period of time. You know, I think that's going to start getting more and more standard as well as, you know, Adam, you mentioned which was really interesting because I don't know if you saw this particular bullet on the notes, but you mentioned that it's almost like warfare or an all out war. And there's actually people who are talking about it at a nation state level where they're talking about maybe we need to have an international agreement similar to the Geneva convention where you're setting limits on what is and is not within bounds for attack, right? Like, Geneva Convention outlaws chemical warfare. It outlaws, I think, landmines and stuff like that. So, um, you know, there's limits on um, POW, like what you can do for POWs. And so maybe we need something like that for cybersecurity, right? Critical infrastructure is out of bounds. Can't do that. Can't hack or do ransomware for like a nuclear, you know, uh, power plant or something like that or nuclear weapons. Um, So that's... Maybe something that may be coming down the pipe. Uh, I think that would be a good idea to have some sort of international agreement. And, of course, it would be on the nation itself to kind of police its own, which we did see a little bit of that. Russia kind of put some pressure on their cyber criminals after the Biden administration talked to them. And I think, you know, having some limits may be a good thing. And just some international agreement on what is um, within bounds for attacks like that. So it's going to be out of frame here, but on my bookshelf up here, I've got Satya Nadella's book, Hit Refresh here. Um, Probably out of frame a little bit is a book by Microsoft's president, Brad Smith, and it's called Tools and Weapons. And Brad Smith is Microsoft's president and chief legal officer, and he has been calling for many, many years now that we need a digital Geneva Convention to set out exactly those points you talk about. So this is something where, again... You know, Microsoft and and Brad Smith in particular have been kind of thought leaders in this space calling for many years that it is time to put into writing 
some of the agreed upon things that are off limits that just have no place in, in modern human interactions where again, poisoning the water supply of civilians is not okay. You know, um, if you, if you can go s- steal some cryptocurrency or something, you know, good for you, but hurting innocent civilians should be off limits in the same way that like landmines and stuff like that are off limits. And so it, it's a great book, a great read, um, highly recommend it as, as something, if you want to go a little deeper in this space and think about what that looks like tools and weapons by Brad Smith, uh, definitely a recommended read here. And we'll put a link in the show notes to that book as well. Um, but, but right on subject for what you're talking about, Andy. Yeah, I mean, the Geneva Convention, same thing, all outlaws attacking, like, hospitals, right, medics. That's why they're, you can have the Red Cross symbol on, on a truck, and it should be off limits to attack. Just like, you know, ransomware attacks on hospitals. You know, that's really looked down upon, um, even in the cyber criminal world. Uh, so, yeah, I think uh, hopefully some of the leaders will get there ducks in a row and and get talking on that, you know, and then looking forward to kind of 2022, uh, as far as budgets, you know, I read this article that talked about 80% of organizations, according to a survey are looking at increasing their budgets, their cybersecurity budgets for 2022, nearly a quarter of them are increasing as much as 31 to 50% over the last year. And then at least one, I'm sorry, four and 10 are increasing their budgets at least 11 to 30%. So it's important to know as well that a lot of the people who responded to the survey said that there is a lot of executive buy-in. So their C-suite and their board members are involved in the planning for the cybersecurity strategy. And then the big thing that I had to take away for on this particular one is you know, you can buy all the tools in the world. You can increase your budget to prep for the different solutions that you're going to buy. But if you don't have any people to implement those solutions or you don't have any time to implement those solutions, then it's really not going to do any good. And so 88% of the organizations actually anticipated that the cyber skills gap will impact their 2022 cybersecurity strategy. And over half of them said that they expected an impact and that they will need new team members in order to execute their strategies for 2022. So, you know, utilize partners, maybe that may be an answer. There's a lot of external socks or um, partners that can help implement solutions. And that can cost maybe more in the short term, but employees always cost a little bit more in the long term, but also look at hiring staff. You know, look at hiring junior staff and training them up. Or we've talked about cross-training folks within your organization, maybe with a security champions program. But I think investing in people, number one, should be the primary uh, goal when it comes to your budget. So if you're increasing your budget, I'm hoping that you're increasing your headcount too, because that's something that is sorely needed in our industry, especially, you know, we had that discussion last week on mental health. Everyone is burnt out. You know, you need to take time away from work, but you can't do that if you're constantly having to work. And I think as cybersecurity defenders, we hold a lot of the responsibility on our shoulders to make sure that the company stays safe. And we just can't step away if if there's alerts that are popping up all the time. They, you know, they have to be triaged by somebody. So... Hiring more staff is probably something, if you're a hiring manager, you know, make sure that you're looking at headcount as well as maybe some critical tools. But if you're already good on tools, I would hope that you're looking at headcount to alleviate the stress of your current team. I don't know a single organization I've talked to that is using all of their tools to their fullest ability. And I would feel comfortable saying isn't missing anything from an alerting or, or incident perspective. I don't think that exists. So I totally agree with the call out on adding headcount. I think every security team needs to add headcount. 
which means it's going to be competitive and which means there might not be enough talent to go around. So we've talked many, many times on the show on alternative places to look for talent. It is there. And there are people who certainly understand the growth nature of this business, the need for this business and want to get into it. And so encourage you to add headcount, take some stress off your existing people and allow you to better use the tools you already have in place. Uh, very much in favor of that. At the same time, I think if you are adding tools, think about tools that can amplify the human ingenuity on your team. And my pitch there would be just think about if you've been kind of doing the same strategy, you know, there's, there's this old saying that the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. And if you are having trouble scaling, having trouble integrating, having trouble wrapping your arms around the volume of alerts that come in in a day, perhaps a different strategy is in order with regards to your tools as well. And there's an opportunity here as this has so much executive attention and board attention, and it sounds like increased investment year over year to maybe say, Hey, we need to, we need to redo some things. You know, we've been doing this kind of according to the strategy that everyone else has been doing it. And candidly, hasn't worked out great for the cybersecurity business, you know, industry over the last year or so. We we can do more, we can do better, and that might require us to retool a bit, you know, take a different approach. So uh, this is encouraging. I'm very excited about the fact that very broadly across the enterprise and across the business sector, there is uh, an understanding that there's the need to increase investment. And that's awesome. Anytime you're in an industry and the industry is growing and investment is flowing in, that's a good thing. But let's make sure we're good stewards of that money and remember why we're there. And that is to enable and to protect the business and allow the business to function unimpeded, both from internal sources like us, as well as external forces like the bad guys. You know, if you add a ton of friction to protect against the bad guys, then you haven't really helped solve the problem. You've just moved the problem to your internal team instead. So uh, this is this is great news. And, and again, I like finishing on a high note here, which this definitely is. Yeah, just a quick note on the skills gap as well. You know, we've talked about where to find talent. I just want to mention that, you know, when I was at my previous organization, I was the one who was posting a lot of uh, our positions, our open positions on social media because I had presence on social media. I was involved in some of the cybersecurity discords that had, you know, job um, channels that you could post open jobs. And so I would get a lot of people asking me about these jobs and I would kind of do a first discussion with them and, and view of their resume before I pass them on to have them apply. And Doug and Nate, who have both been on the show, who are my my boss and coworkers uh, previously, you know, they would kind of ping me on, on what I thought about each one. We talked at length about some of these people who were applying and many of them were looking for their first cybersecurity position. You know, we had one guy who was um, an engineer at Boeing, very smart guy. Uh, was trying to break into cybersecurity. You know, he had taken a few certifications and, you know, I, I linked up with him on LinkedIn and he is now, he was a blue teamer, SOC analyst. Now he's a pen tester for the same company um, as a red teamer. There's some Navy uh, guy who um, had military experience, had a bunch of certifications, you know, all self-study um Again, looking for his first position, ended up getting you know a cybersecurity analyst position at one company. Um, another one uh, who was a uh, um, also looking for their their first position and ended up getting a uh, architect position with a um, Avande, I think is the the uh, um, the partner. It's a Microsoft partner. And uh, he became a cloud security architect. You know, again, self-study, um, got a degree in cybersecurity, but was looking for his first position. And we talked about each one of these candidates at length and kind of figuring out whether they would fit into the culture, whether it had the, the ability to succeed. And 
I think I advocated for each one of them, but in the end, it was still kind of you know Doug's decision whether or not he wanted to even interview or hire them. And I understand the risk when you're looking at somebody who hasn't had that experience, but I do want to urge people who are in these positions who are hiring managers to look at the potential to learn, right? The potential to succeed. Do they have the desire? Do they have the will? You know, I can teach someone a tool. They can understand you know, as long as they understand the concepts around it, which they do if they're passing these certifications, you know, they will have the ability to succeed. So don't write people off. I mean, we're short as it is in this industry. Now make sure you're not writing off talent that has the ability to succeed, has the ability to learn the job. It may take you two to three months to spin them up. But if you don't hire anyone for six, seven months, I mean, you're stressing your team out for those six, seven months, right? I'd rather hire someone who has the ability to learn, spin them up in two to three months, and then you have someone who's productive. So that's my soapbox there. I'll, I'll get off of it. But yeah, just, just don't write people off because you know I'm, I'm linking up with these people, talking to them, looking for their first position, and I see them succeeding in the industry. Several of them that I've talked to that didn't get hired at the position that we were looking for but have found success with other companies and, you know, congratulations to them. I wish them the best of luck. Your last point was probably the, you know, the encapsulation of your, of the overall message there. If you're going to hunt for that perfect candidate, which doesn't exist and keep that job rack or that job posting open for six, seven, eight months, instead of bringing somebody in and training them up in two to three months, you've actually cost your team more time and put more your company at greater risk than just bringing somebody in and seeing if they work out. And there are ways to bring people in in kind of a probationary manner at a lot of organizations, uh, whether that's hiring them through contract or, or through uh, methods like that or, or other tools available to you at your org. Get them in there and, and at least see you know if it's going to work out or not, as opposed to holding out for somebody that might not materialize. I, I think it's really... And I'm not a hiring manager, but do have my fingers in the industry pulse enough to understand that there is not a <laughs> massive amount of talent just sitting around waiting for a new job right now. You, you know, we're at very full employment. We need more people than exist, in all honesty, in cybersecurity. So it is incumbent on you if you are in cybersecurity and you're doing hiring. It's not just like a nice to have; it's a need to have to find that source of talent that isn't traditional because otherwise you're going to be sitting on the sidelines. I I think at this point it really is kind of that clear that you can't just go through your traditional methods and channels to bring people into this business. You're going to have to think differently. Yeah. Well, that was a great discussion. Nice to cap off 2021 this way and bring in the new year. Hope everyone has a happy new year and we'll talk to you guys in the new year. Our contact information will be in the show notes. If you have any questions on the episode or have topics that you want us to talk about. Thanks. And we'll talk to you guys next year. Thank you for listening to the blue security podcast. Please check out the show notes, catch up on episodes you may have missed and subscribe. So you don't miss any future episodes. Find Andy on Twitter at a jaw zero and Adam at AJ Brewer. See you at our next episode.